Hi, I'm Paul from Trending, Who, What, Where, and When. Today, I will be speaking with Raymond Blake about his book, Cote d'Or, The Wines and Winemakers of the Heart of Burgundy. Raymond will be joining us from Dublin, Republic of Ireland. Hello, my name is Raymond Blake and I'm speaking to you from Dublin in Ireland, my home city. I'm here to talk to you about uh, Cote d'Or, my, my book on Burgundy which uh, was published a couple of years ago and which details the wines and winemakers of my favourite wine region in the world, Burgundy in eastern France. I look forward to elaborating in great detail on uh, what it contains and my great love for the wines and the people of that region. So I guess I would start by asking where you would take visitors when they come to visit you in Dublin. Yes, uh, Dublin is very visitor friendly for a start. Uh, well open to, to that sort of thing. It's, and Dublin is also a relatively small, geographically a relatively small city. So walking around is, is, is very easy and manageable. And I would always encourage people to stay centrally if you can, and then you can explore on foot. You can go back to your hotel if you get tired, you can lie down, that sort of thing. Um, I studied at Trinity College Dublin, and so I would have a certain affinity there. And there's the old library in Trinity. Is It's like it's one of the great sites of Ireland really. It's got this magnificent um, wooden barrel vaulted um, room. It's I think it's 65 metres long or something like that. Um, absolutely wonderful. And uh, I was privileged, you might say, to um, to work there for a while. I was I was researching. My very first book was a rowing book about, about the sport of crew rowing. You know, that was my sport. And our boat club in Trinity was founded in 1836. So for the 150th anniversary, I, I wrote the the history of the club but I would walk along that long room every day to get to what was called the old manuscripts room where all the old minute books and everything were um, were were stored and uh, it, there's a gorgeous it's very hard to you can't really convey a smell on the internet but uh, the smell of old books old leather and and that sort of thing was wonderful so I, I would say that's a that's a must see uh, in Dublin um, I, I also, um, one of the hotels I could recommend would be the Merion Hotel, which is co-owned by a friend of mine. But one of the real reasons for staying there is because they've got magnificent art collection on the wall. So you don't even have to leave the hotel uh, and you're almost visiting an art gallery there as well. So um, there's, there's lots to, to see and do there. Where we, um, where we live ourselves, myself and my wife, is just, just south of the city centre. I can walk to the city centre in about 30 minutes but we're very very close to the sea and I can walk to the sea here Dublin Bay in five minutes and walk along the seafront there there's a walk there and that's something else which I, I, I love to do and would recommend to people. Um, it's hard to know where to stop but Dublin's parks are lovely as well we're very well served by public parks they're very well kept maintained um, all over the place there's, there's, there are different parks you know so yeah, well worth visiting. And the Dublin dining scene, I should finish by saying, the Dublin dining scene is far, far better than it ever was. I would say to anybody watching or listening, I would say banish ideas of just, you know, bacon and cabbage, which you can still get if you want to. I mean, there's the cuisine in, 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 in Dublin, in Ireland is, is far superior to what it once was. I should also warn you and say that dining out is expensive, both food and drink, it's expensive but uh, it's very high quality. We noticed that when we were there, you seem like you have really high quality grass fed beef and things like that. Yeah, that's right. Another great glory of Ireland as a modern, relatively new um, foodstuff are Irish cheeses. Um, when I was growing up, the cheese was rubbish. You know, it was processed cheese, um, terrible stuff. Now the Irish cheeses are world beating without any shadow. I'm not wearing emerald tinted spectacles when I say that. The Irish cheeses are really top notch. Indeed, one year we take, when we go, when we go to our house in Burgundy, uh, we every summer we take our car, we go on a ferry across to France and I brought three Irish cheeses with me. I knew I was having some winemakers and their wives coming for dinner, you know, just a few days later. So we had an Irish cheese board and a French cheese board side by side and they were in no way shamed and indeed you know, you've got to pick your guests carefully so that they're open-minded enough, but they really loved them. They loved these cheeses, you know. So that's something else well worth well worth seeking out when you're if you're if you get to Ireland.
tell us about your evolution as a wine writer leading up to your writing of your book, Cote d'Or. Well, as I mentioned there earlier, uh, the first book I wrote was a, was a history of, of um, the Boat Club in Trinity. That was about, published about 30 years ago. I was working then as a schoolmaster in um, a school called Clongo's Wood College. It's a very famous Irish boarding school. It's where James Joyce went to school, for instance. Uh, he went there um, aged six and a half, or as he said himself, half past six. And um, it's, it's, you know, Irish prime ministers have, have been to school there. It's, it's very well acknowledged and recognised. Um, and while I was working there, I saw an ad looking for a, a wine writer uh, for, a, for a magazine. And instead of just applying for the ad, or just applying for the thing, I, um, I wrote to the publisher and I invited him out for dinner. And uh, he immediately contacted me and he said, my God, Rem, he said, every freeloader in Ireland is looking for this gig, he said, and one of them has invited me for dinner. He said, so uh, I'll meet you for dinner. So that was the most choreographed dinner ever. I had the whole thing arranged in advance. I'd been in, I'd chosen the wines, I said, chosen the table, where he'll sit, where I'll sit, everything, you know. So that got me that gig anyway. And then um, I, can I was getting up like at five o'clock in the morning to write for two hours. I'd go to school, teach, during the holidays, travel everywhere, I'd travel to Australia, to the States, California, upstate New York, um, South America, wherever. Um, and then I met my wife and I actually had to interview her. She was going with the Irish Chamber Orchestra. She's a classical violinist. And she was going with the Irish Chamber Orchestra. She was the director to play in the Barossa Valley Music Festival in in Australia. Barossa is probably the most famous wine region in Australia. So um, one of their people, one of her backroom people thought if we can get a bit of um, uh, publicity for this for, from a wine writer, maybe not from the musical side of things. So I was arranged to, to interview her and uh, I wasn't really looking forward to it. I mean, I thought, oh God, this is a bit dull. You know, it's a Sunday afternoon and I was, could be doing something better. But the minute I met her, I <laughs> So the only question I asked, I remember asking her was, you know, what's your phone number um, in case I need to check something, you know, before before a copy deadline, that sort of thing. So I gave up the teaching then and plunged headlong into into the, the wine writing. And then not long afterwards, we bought the house in Burgundy um, and immediately bought the house in Burgundy. I said, you know, I've got to write a book about this. So any visit that I made, whether we were there for a week or a month, I kept a diary. And the, the interesting thing is, I always say to people, the thing to write down in the diary is the thing that you're certain you will remember. Oh, there's no point putting down, you know, that little insignificant fact. If you think that, write it down, because that's the thing you will forget. And sometimes those little gems, they become gems. They're not all gems, but they become gems and you can hang a story on them. Just some tiny observation, which seemed inconsequential at the time, but it just adds that little bit of color. So straight away, I kept the diary. Then I, um, I, I was put into contact with a, an agent, a lady who divides her time between New York and um, Dublin. Um, and we got a contract for the book to be published in, in New York in 2013. And that same publisher, they're called Skyhorse, they're publishing my next book, which is with them at the moment. Um, I saw the cover the other day, I'm really pleased with it and the, it's due to be published early next year. So that was, that was, you know, writing was, I always wanted to write, even when I was a kid, you know, I, I always wanted to write and I was always interested in wine. So that's how I've, I've gone that way. Well, it looks like you have a large amount of magazines that you write stories for in Ireland, UK and the US. Over the years, yes, I've, I've um, typically what happens is when you would go away visiting a region, if you were being hosted, you were with a group and you'd meet, or you'd go to a big wine fair or something like that, and you would meet um, editors or that sort of thing. And I was always, I always made sure to meet these people and say, hey, you know, do you want this article, do you want that article, and that sort of thing. So that's that's how that developed. Um, the way things are going, and I think COVID has, has um, accelerated some underlying trends, which were already there, and move really from print, traditional print, into more online engagement and so forth. And it sort of forced me to reassess things over the last year. And in fact, things have worked out quite well for me, where 
I um, I've, I've started doing a lot of online um, presentations for companies who wanted to entertain staff or clients, that sort of thing. One of the huge advantages is that the attendees can be anywhere. So I did one for an Irish company recently who've got offices in different cities around the country and everyone can stay in their own place and be entertained and meet one another, you know. Um, so I'm hopeful that that sort of thing continues. I think the whole engagement with wine um, is going to change. Uh, there's going to be much more of that online. Um, there will be, I'm going back, what, next week I'm, I'm going to do my first in-person event in, I don't know how long, in 15 months. I'm, I'm flying to London next week for the, in the London Wine Club there, 67 Pal Mal it's called. And um, I'll be doing a burgundy presentation there. And I'll also be, you know, 67 is, is a physical building, obviously a, a club, but it had basically had to close during COVID and they instantly turned themselves into a virtual club and they produced a whole range of, um, of, of, of wine events for people where you could buy samples of the wines and so forth. And that was so successful that even though they've reopened now, they've decided to do their own TV channel. And I will be, I will be um, recording pieces. I've just today, I had a, a Zoom call earlier today with the lady there with regard to organizing um, the shooting of, of six individual pieces next week when I'm there. So anybody who's watching uh, watching this this um, interview, we'll be able to watch those on 67 uh, TV, 67 Pal Mal, it's called. I think that would really increase your audience. People everywhere could see you then. Yeah, I think so. I, I really do think that's the future. And from the feedback that I've got from presenting, as I say, a lot of events this year, uh, I'm getting good feedback from people. I mean, a lot of it has spread just by word of mouth. One company says to another, did you get that guy, Blake? Did you get Raymond Blake? Yeah, here's his details. We, we really enjoyed it and we're going to use them again. So that, that I'm really, really pleased with that. I'm looking forward to going back to as well to, I was doing an increasing number of in-person events, uh, whether it was a club, like a, you know, a tennis club or a golf club or something like that would commission me to, to present an event or a private dinner for maybe 12 people. Um, and a lot of that went west, but it'll come back. Um, you know, for, for, for um, presenting wines. And I really enjoy that. I really enjoy that part of it. You must be constantly busy with all these different situations <laughs> that you, between writing books, magazines, and these different videos that you're doing. Yes, it keeps me busy. It keeps me occupied. But I suppose it's hard to, it's hard to draw a line between, you know, my work and my hobby because they, one just segues into the other. You know, I'm, I've, I'm a wine nutcase, to be honest with you. And um, I really enjoy it. One of the things I find is, it is a bit of a challenge where you have so many different strands that, that you know, sometimes you're, you're spreading yourself quite wide and you're, you're keep juggling a lot of balls in the air sort of thing. Um, and then you, you just need to be careful that you, you're maintaining, you're just keeping on top of things, you know? Um, but I'm always fizzing with ideas. That's one thing about me. I've always got ideas. I've, I can't keep up with my ideas, actually. Pitching ideas to people, suggesting, why don't I do this? Just before I came, I came to talk to you there now, I sent something off to a company who I've already done stuff for. Um, and I know that they're 20 years old this year. So maybe we could do something maybe later in the year to celebrate that. And maybe we'd get wines from 20 years ago, the year they were founded and that sort of thing. So I'm always thinking something like that. Um, I've got a bottle of wine, changing the subject slightly, I have a bottle of wine now from 1971, so it's 50 years old, and I know a couple, a winemaking couple, who um, were married in 1950, 71, and I've arranged to drink this with them, and then maybe do an interview and a profile of them for one of the magazines I write for. So I'm always thinking of these things, yeah. Unique ideas. Yeah, trying to, yeah, and, and also to pitch it to what I would call my strengths. I always say to people, if I'm doing an event and I'm introduced, a live event, I'm introduced um, as our wine expert here tonight, the first thing I say is, I say I'm not a wine expert, I'm a wine enthusiast. I know a fair bit about wine, but there's people out there who know more about wine, but I've never met anyone 
more enthusiastic about wine than I am. And that's, that's what point. I said. And the events I try to do, I always say to people, they're not master classes, they're armchair traveler events. I want to take you um, with me through the wines and the photographs that I use to wherever region we're going. And I've been really, really fortunate over the last 20, 25 years to visit so many places and take photographs. I mean, on my laptop here, I've got about 21,000 photographs from all around the world. And prior to that, and I'm going to get these digitized. I have uh, transparencies, maybe another 2,000 transparencies taken from the pre-digital age, you know? And of course, there's much fewer photographs then because you think about it, you didn't, you know, you couldn't see what you just photographed. So you, taking a photograph then when you had a roll of film in the camera, it's a much more precious thing to do. You know, you didn't, you know, with your digital uh, camera phone, now you, you knock off six or eight photographs just to be sure that somebody isn't blinking or something like that. But you didn't do that when you just had a roll of film. So that's a fantastic library. I, I, when I present, when I present for people, I just dip into that and I put together a PowerPoint presentation which matches the wines we're having and so forth. And um, off we go. So I have a great, I've already made resource there already, you know, and I'm not sure that level of travel that I did, I'm not sure it's going to come back, you know? Um, and I mean that right across the board, talking to somebody the other day, a big a partner in a big international law firm who I might be doing something for. And he just said, they've said, they're going to try and cut down their travel by about half, you know, they'll, they'll do more of this sort of thing and it'll be more considered and that sort of thing, you know, so we'll see. Well, tell us about your book, Caught to Or. Okay, so that, the first book I wrote was about this, really a story more than anything else about buying the house in Burgundy um, and, and doing it up and so forth. That was Breakfast in Burgundy. That's the one. That's yeah. the one, yeah. There it is there. I saw it back there too. Yeah, yep. there it is there. So that was, that was the story. And as a consequence, off the back of that, then I was commissioned to write Cote d'Or, uh, this book here. And it, um, it's a more formal wine book, you might say. It's part of um, what's known as the Classic Wine Library, a series of books about different regions, different styles and so forth, written by people who have a, a, an in-depth knowledge of those, of those regions. Um, just, just to explain, Cote d'Or typically means, it's usually translated to mean the golden slope. So Cote is like side or slope, um, and d'Or, d apostrophe or the, the golden slope. It, it also is interpreted as meaning the east facing slope, because it's facing the orient, the east. Um, so who, I think Slope of Gold is better, actually. So anyway, with regard to that book, as I say, a more formal um, examination of the region um, with profiles of about 100 different producers, which is quite a small number, actually. You know, I had to be careful. And I wanted to be, it be really careful that I didn't just do a sort of a, a top-down list of 100 producers. I wanted some of the, the great famous names who are, you know, 24 carat wines, but not all of them, because I wanted some of the small family domains who own a couple of acres um, and make wine at a, at a more humble level. But with regard to the region itself, you know, there's no, I, there's no, nobody could argue with me when I say that right at the moment, it's the most sought after, the most celebrated, the most fabled wine region in the world. Um, the prices that are paid the top wines now are unimaginably high. They're just freakishly high. And the same for the best vineyard land. Like you're talking of tens of millions per hectare for the very best, the very best uh, vineyards. And I did a little exercise recently. There was, a, there was an auction recently of some wines uh, from the cellar of a, a deceased winemaker now. His name was Henri Jaillet. Now he was probably the most celebrated Burgundy winemaker in the second half of the last century. And there was an auction of his wines that came from his cellar. So that meant the, the provenance was, was excellent. You know, they, they were impeccable provenance. And they sold for an average price of $27,000 a bottle, right? 
So some of them were more than that, obviously. So I used to teach maths, you see. So I did a little sum and I worked out that that price per bottle was equivalent to $180 per teaspoon. So for a teaspoon of those wines, $180. So that's probably more than more expensive than Chanel number no. five or anything. You know, I can't think of any liquid that would be more uh, expensive than that, you know. So um, very serious, very serious. Is there any passage from your book you would like to read and share with us? The Cote d'Or is, 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 is like a string of villages, a string of pearls, some people will say. You know, one village to the next to the next. So the names of the villages are also the names of the wines. So people will probably have heard of Gevre Chambertin, that's a village. Um, Chambol Musigny, that's a village, and a, they're a village and wine. Um, and typically what you've got there is in all these hyphenated names, Gevre Chambertin, Gevre is actually the name of the village itself. And then they added on the Chambertin, which was the name of their most famous vineyard. So the most famous, most prestigious vineyard in Gevre was Chambertin. Similarly in Chambol was Musigny. And if the Cote d'Or has a, a center, if it has the, like the most celebrated spot in the Cote d'Or is a place called Vaune Romanet. And Romanet is the name, Vaune is the village, Romanet is the name of the, um, of the vineyard. And I've, I just want to read to you there about Von Romanet. Von Romanet might be rural, but it is not rustic. There is a, there's a reserved feel to this, the most celebrated of all the Cote d'Or villages, a feel given visible emphasis by the manicured vineyards that rub shoulders with manicured properties. There's nothing ramshackle about Von. Everything in is, is in its place, as if ready to serve as a film set. The domain names, some blazon surprisingly large on gable walls, others discreet to the point of invisibility, form a prize roll call famed across the wine world. Vaughan is the source of the Coke d'Or's greatest red wines, combining finesse and vigor like no other commune. All sorts of arguments can be put forward for the nobility of a great Chambertin or the harmony of a top Musigny, but Vaughan, the person of an ensemble top grand crew goes a step further. There's the muscle of Chambertin and the grace of Musigny and then so. The combination and the resulting extra dimension of flavor can make the others seem less complex. It is utterly beguiling and not easy to pin down. Sweet incense is my best attempt. Describing a great Vaughan in words is a challenge. Where the others are often pigeonholed by gender, Vaughan is trickier to categorize. There's an intangible quality. Full understanding seems to lie just beyond reach. Like poetry, it can be returned to again and again when another shade or nuance of flavor is discovered. That's Von Romane for you. And I wish I could afford more, but I do get a little bit now and then. You and your wife have owned a house in Burgundy region since 2006. And with that, you wrote your book, Breakfast in Burgundy, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, as I say, um, that was that right from the very day we got the house, I thought I'm going to write a book about this. And as I say, I kept a diary about it. Um, it, 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 it records the ups and downs of, of life there, you know, um, the, the great joy of, of meeting wonderful neighbours and then perhaps the opposite, uh, meeting not so wonderful neighbours. Well, we made some great friends there. We um, went through all sorts of trials and tribulations, renovating the house. Now it wasn't, it wasn't a wreck. We didn't buy a wreck. We bought a house, you know, there was a lady living in it, but it was dowdy. Um, it needed a new bathroom, new kitchen, that sort of thing. But it didn't need a new roof. It wasn't falling down. And we would visit, we would visit typically um, for July and August every year. And then at other times we might go for Christmas, might go for Easter. I would then visit also on my own at times. I might visit during harvest, which is a really good time to be there, to be reporting on the, the harvest and so forth. That's our house there. And you know, what I wrote in the book actually about um, what really sold us the house. And I have to say, I take my hat off to the estate agent because he brought us in through the garden gate rather than the, the main gate off the road, brought us in through the garden gate and this, cherry blossom tree was in full bloom in, in mid-April and 
that year. And of course, the minute we saw the tree, we thought, oh, for God's sake, this is brilliant, you know. Uh, so I think the tree, more than anything else, sold us the house. And there's a nice south facing garden. So during the summer, we, we would set up a, a gazebo in the garden. We have an outdoor room, you might say. But I love it at any time of year, even in winter, when it's covered in snow and it's bitterly cold and you certainly can't go outdoors. But sometimes when people ask me, um, what's the advantage, what's the great advantage of owning a house in Burgundy? I always say, well, look at this. This is what you can do. I just need to flick on a bit here. But um, I'm able to collect my wine from my neighbour in a wheelbarrow. Yeah. And um, I know I say that tongue in cheek, but it is a great advantage to just walk up and have a tasting with, with these people, these near neighbours of ours. And um, their name is, their surname is Vincent, Vincent. Their wines are available in the United States. They're superb um, white wines and very good red wines. Um, a family, husband and wife, and their daughter is now coming in as well shortly. She's, she's um, training and will, will eventually take over from her father. Let me just see what else have I got there. Um, that's Jean-Marc Vincent. Last, that's taken last year during harvest. Um, uh, Pinot Noir grapes just, just uh, harvested. That was late August last year, late August last year. Maybe you could share with us your involvement in the Infinite Ideas Classic Wine Library. They published 23 books, of which yours are some of them. That's, that's right. My, I've one book with Infinite Ideas. That's the Cote d'Or book, part of the, the Classic Wine Library. Now, I wouldn't have a, a huge sort of involvement there as such. They, they're, they're sort of at, sit at the center of a, we're all like spokes on a wheel, almost all the different authors that um, uh, write, write for them. Um, but I'd, I'd be very friendly with, with one of the editors there. He's also a writer. I've known him for many years. And um, then obviously me, me, met the publisher, first of all, to, to do the deal and so forth. And at some stage down the line, uh, and COVID would have slowed this down, there would be a revised second edition of the book. So I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't want to make promises I can't keep, but I think that that might get underway next year um, for everybody, even for myself, to feel comfortable about not just traveling, but in and out of places, visiting, going here, there and yonder. You know, we all want to feel comfortable about that. And even if restrictions are being raised at the moment, you're still being urged to be more careful than usual. So, for instance, I'm due to go, myself and my wife are due to go, you know, provided, fingers crossed, we're due to go to Burgundy again next month, August um, 2021. But I'll do what I did last year there, and more than anything else, I will walk through the vineyards. Walking in the vineyards is wonderful exploration. And I never had done an awful lot of it because I would typically go and visit the wine cellars, visit the domains, the estates, and taste wine. And last year, I could have done that, but I said, no, I think I'll just stand back a bit. And this year I'll do the same because you never know how many people you're going to be meeting and interacting with and so forth. So um, walking in the vineyards, you can be 200 yards from the nearest person and you're not wasting your time. I mean, it is really, really instructive. One of the things about Burgundy, it's worth emphasizing, is that the, the, the land is minutely parcellated, tiny, tiny um, little plots of land. Uh, and they say, of course, that it was the, the Cistercian monks who did this and um, who got down, they say they got down and tasted the soil. And um, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but they worked out that you know, there were, were noticeable and definable differences from one plot to another. And one of the reasons for that is uh, that because it's a it's a fault line. There was there was like a slippage, which if you can imagine like a, a layer like all my fingers as like a, a sort of a layer cake, um, which then was cut and uh, diagonally and then exposed a whole lot of different soils and subsoils. And it means that literally, if you move from from here to there, um, you can have a different type of subsoil and then a different type of wine. And people often say, well, hold on a second, you know, how can that happen? Uh, it, how could it be the case that, for instance, just from one side of the road to the other, that it changes? Well, my view is that the monks initially worked out the change, and then you mark it by building a path 
put the path of where the change is, then that defines the change straight away, you know? And you can see this, if you go, if you go to a cellar, so all the wines are made by the same person. And if you taste them all from the same vintage, right? You're ruling out all sorts of variables. The only variable then is the vineyard that the wines come from. And typically what you do is with the winemaker, you work your way up through the hierarchy of, of from the basic vineyards, they call them village vineyards, then premier cru vineyards, and then grand cru vineyards. And it's amazing the difference. It just, it's, it's, it really is incredible how everything is ramped up, every dimension of the first wine, which may have been very satisfying, is amplified into the next one and amplified again. And there's just greater length, greater depth, greater breath, greater reverber, like an echo, you know, just an echo going on longer and longer. And um, the, 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 the taste remaining on your palate and in your throat for longer. And that, that essentially is coming from the ground. You're getting better and better ground that it's coming from. And that's the real signature of Burgundy is the um, incredible parcel. And that parcellation, those, that's exacerbated. It's a natural um, phenomenon, but it's exacerbated by the fact that the Napoleonic code of inheritance says that, you know, if there's three children, they inherit equally. So if it's a 10 hectare domain, it goes three ways. Um, and then what might happen is, let's say this son who inherited one third from his parents, he marries this lady who in inherited one half from her parents, and they go together then to create a new domain, a new name. And this happens, keeps happening all the time. And it's hugely complicated. And that's why I love it so much, because there's always something I need to explain. It never stops. It never, it's never fixed. I, I liken it to, you know, like a, a slowly turning kaleidoscope where the pieces are sort of moving and shifting and interacting and changing their orientation. The whole thing ultimately remains the same in, in terms of the overall package, but the orientation and so on uh, keeps changing. And um, so you're getting this constant sort of division, but also coming together again because of um, marriages and so forth. It's very complicated because what might also happen, for instance, I'll try and keep this as simple as possible. You've got three children of a domain. Only one of them decides that they're gonna stay and, and work the domain. The other two, one becomes an architect, one becomes an airline pilot, but they still own their one third. So what might happen then is they might rent it to their sibling. Uh, and, and, and let that work. So the sibling becomes the figurehead and to all intents and purposes, and to many outsiders, you, uh, you say to yourself, um, oh, he's the owner of the domain, but he's not really. He's the owner of one third of it and he's renting maybe the other two thirds from his siblings, something like that. And then one of the tricks or problems that comes up is that if the other two who don't have much connection, maybe they've moved away, maybe they live abroad, if they see, hey, look, the 10 hectares that our parents owned, right, they're now worth an absolute fortune. Why don't we sell? And of course they can. They can sell over because they're now the majority. And this is happening as well. This is causing quite a bit of upset, really, really wealthy people coming in who just want a, a bauble, you know, for, oh, I've got, have you seen my super yacht? Have you seen my um, estate in Burgundy? And this is happening as well. So there's all sorts of tensions. It's, it's not always good news, you know. Before we went there, um, we sorry, before we bought the house, we went and we holidayed for two years. Now, I had been <coughs> to Burgundy numerous times before that, but it was my wife's first, first visit. And it was going to be a, it's a toss up between Burgundy and Bordeaux. That was definitely going to be it, you know. And one of the reasons that I convinced myself Burgundy was better, it's never really come into play. But Burgundy is much further east in France than Bordeaux. So within a couple of hours drive of Burgundy, you can go to six other prestigious wine regions. You can drive north to Alsace, you can drive to the Champagne region, you can drive to the Loire, you can go south to the Rhone, 
you can go a bit further over and you you can go down um into into northwestern Italy and indeed you can drive across to Bordeaux as we as we've done but if we'd gone to Bordeaux you know everything was much further away I mean if you go west from Bordeaux you're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean there's no, there's no wine region out there but the funny thing is having made that argument in favor of Burgundy that you know we could visit so many other places we only have done it a couple of times because once we get there we say I might stay here you know it's it's lovely. And we both, pre-COVID, were traveling a lot. My wife's a violinist, she was traveling all over the world. So we're both traveling an awful lot. So travel was very much part of our work. You, you get there, you put your feet on the ground, and you say, ah, no, no, it's fine. We'll, we'll stay here. We're very happy where we are here, rather than starting to travel again, you know? So that, that argument, which was valid, it's never really come into play. But I think even without that, I think we would have probably I love that small scale, the artisanal scale of, um, of Burgundy and the compactness of it. Um, if you were in, you could be a bit isolated uh, in, in say the Medoc and Bordeaux. Um, we didn't want to live in a tiny isolated hamlet. We were, the village that uh, we have our house in is, you know, it's about a thousand people. There's, there's a couple of restaurants, there's a Good boulang a great boulangerie actually. They not all the villages have good boulangeries. And um, there's a butcher, there's a little supermarket, there's a hairdresser's, there's a pharmacy, you know. There are some of the villages, you know, they really don't have all that. So um, that's what sold us. And we're really happy there. We've, it's, we've had such wonderful times there, really wonderful times. Uh, we organized a, for one of our neighbors, you know, we organized a 50th birthday party for him, you know. And like, he was absolutely astounded that we would do this. And a whole load of our friends came from Ireland, all these people who would have visited us over the years and had met this man over the years. They said, oh yeah, we'll come out. Yeah, of course we will. And of course he was even further amazed by that. But all these people, like, he just couldn't believe it. No one in France did this for him. But we organized a big party for him. And we had a great time, of course, you know, we love a party, <laughs> why not? Excuse to open a few bottles and off we went. So I was going to ask if you had any comment on the Putin champagne situation. I keep reading about that here and it sounds so unusual, so bizarre. It's, it's bizarre. At the same time, I'd have to say there's quite a few what I call clickbait headlines there to get you reading on, you know. Um, I should say I love champagne. Um, we spent our honeymoon in the Champagne region. I'm a huge fan. I have a chapter on champagne in my next book. And um, as soon as I heard about it, I thought, wait a sec, what's, what's going on here? And I read a few things and I saw that, you know, they're going to have to put on the back label of the bottle, they're going to have to call it sparkling wine. And that's all that was said initially. And the first question I asked was, wait a minute, what about the front label? It, it says champagne. And if they can still do that, what's the problem? So I checked and found out, yes, they can still call it champagne on the front label. They must call it sparkling wine on the back label. And um, Russian champagne can be called champagne now. So is it going to affect sales? Well, it's really important to remember that champagne of all the prestige wines particularly, it's the most branded of wines. So if you think about it, people, they drink Bollinger or they drink Veuve Clicquot or they drink Laurent Perrier or Paul Roger. And that's what they drink. You know, I'm a Bollinger man. So they go reaching for, but it's not, they're, they're choosing Bollinger first and Champagne second or whatever it might be. So I can't see that, you know, uh, having huge, huge effect. And th this sort of outrage has already diminished. It's like a, it was like a balloon went up and then someone pricked it and said, this is a sort of a non-story folks, you know? Okay. Um, but well, you know, great headlines and everything. It, it'll all settle down again, you know. The, the Champagne people are wonderful marketeers, you know, and they, they protect their name. They're very protective of their name. You know, they'll send in, um, they'll, they'll send in their attorneys at the slightest uh, um, sign of someone usurping their name. So that certainly didn't, didn't, didn't please them. But I think, I think in a year's time, someone will say, do you remember, was there something? There was a bit of a scandal, was there? I can't remember, you know. But uh, I love champagne, so, uh, but actually, 
nowadays you can get really viable alternatives. And up until recently, you know, there was, it was sort of, oh, well, you know, you don't have to buy champagne. You can try this and you try it and you say, yeah, well, it is okay, but it's, you know, maybe not a great substitute. But now English sparkling wine, some of it is absolutely superb. Um, Francia Corta from Italy. Everyone knows of Prosecco from Italy, but Francia Corta from Italy is their best sparkling. And Cava from Spain, which used to be fairly humdrum. It was very much the country cousin. If you get the right producer from Cava, they're fabulous as well. And then also watch out for Tasmania, cool, cool part of, of Australia. And also in the States, they're making some. So there's, there's lots of great sparkling wine being made around the world. Um, so we're not going to run out. That's for sure. We're not going to run out. Do you think we'll see your book, Breakfast in Burgundy, made into a movie or a Netflix series? And who would you want to play your part if, if they did? Well, I'd love if they did, first of all. Um, and I often thought, hey, well, I often thought to myself, but that could work, you know? And I think Matt Damon would do a good job. Okay. <laughs> I think he'd do a good job. Uh, he's also very fond of Ireland. You know, he spent a lot of time in Ireland recently um, with his family and everything. And uh, he said he wants to come back. Um, he was renting a house here for a good stretch, just south of Dublin. And um, just recently I read that he wants to come back again. He said they, he really loved it, you know. So, uh, he, yeah, he, that'd be fine. You know, if he, that'd draw in the crowds, I hope. You know? <laughs> I think that book would make an interesting series. It was an interesting book. Yeah, yeah. I'd, 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 I'd love if it, I, I'm pleased to hear you saying that, and I'd love if it did. And if you know any producers, please... <laughs> Please uh, tell them, because um, I'd be delighted. I'd be delighted if they did, you know. Will you uh, tell us a little more about your upcoming book? That'll be, you, you think it'll be delivered in January or February of next year? I'd say I'm really pleased with that cover, because I think a lot of wine book covers are just a bit sort of worthy, you know, someone with his nose in a glass or something like that. I like the colour and everything. and. Um, I like the, even the title Wine Talk, which I thought of myself, um, because that's exactly what it is. And you see, I mentioned earlier, I always think of myself as an enthusiast and not, a, not an expert. So I've got that in there as well. And just to tell you about it, um, a series of chapters, you know, on my, you might say reflections on my time spent writing about wine and so on and so forth. So I, the chapter of how I got into wine, a chapter, a little bit of winemaking, but not technical. And then I have a chapter called Bubbles, all about champagne and the other ones I talked about. I have another chapter across the pond in the States and so forth. Um, a chapter down under about Australia, a chapter about wine styles, a chapter about accessories, wine glasses and so forth, a chapter about what to eat, a chapter about what I call legacy wines, Sherry, Port and Madeira, which you know, have come down to us from a bygone age but which, um, which would never be made today if they didn't exist, because there's no need for them. They were made because very, you know, painting with a very broad brush stroke, they were made, they were, they were fortified with spirit because um, to strengthen them for long sea voyages and sailing ships, which might spoil the wine. Uh, and then people got a taste for them. And now, you know, if they disappear, they're never coming back, you know? And then I wrote also, a chapter about the States. Um, fascinating for me because, you know, you may have heard the, of the vine disease called phylloxera. Mm -hmm. And um, phylloxera actually came from the States to Europe mm -hmm. and almost destroyed the European um, vine ind wine industry. Because phylloxera is a tiny aphid which eats the roots of the vines, just devastates them. And it moved all around Europe and you know, you'd pull up a vine and there was no root system there. So it, it almost destroyed, um, it almost destroyed the European uh, wine industry. But the interesting thing, the paradox is that the cure, the rescue also came from the States because the rootstocks of American vines were resistant to, to, to phylloxera. They had developed a resistance. So what happened was they shipped rootstocks to Europe onto which the, the vines were grafted. And almost, you know, 99% of vines in Europe now, indeed around the world, 
are grafted onto phylloxera resistant rootstocks. And that, so the, the problem came from the States and then salvation came from the States. But as I then said um, in the book, slightly tongue in cheek, I said that in the United States, having set out, having nearly ruined the Australian, or sorry, the European, having nearly ruined the European um, wine industry, then set about ruining their own wine industry. How? With prohibition. Prohibition came in. You know, the do-gooders had their way, or whatever way you want to look at it. But prohibition came in with the Volstead Act almost exactly 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago. And at a stroke, it almost destroyed the American wine industry. But the paradox was that more grapes were grown in California during prohibition than at any other time. Grape production went up because vast, I mean, huge freight trains of grapes were shipped across the country to places like Chicago, to um, New York, to big cities of the East. And people then made wine their, themselves. They made wine at home, bathtub wine, you might call it. Wow. And this became a huge business. So much so then that, you know, it became more sophisticated. They, they made up grape concentrate, for instance, um, rather than shipping huge amount of grapes, they made up grape concentrate. And they would attach to the grape concentrate, the, the, the jar or whatever it was, they would attach some, some yeast, you see, to, for the fermentation. But this would come with a warning and say, do not, okay. do not add this yeast to the concentrate or fermentation will result. <laughs> of course, you knew what to do then, do the whole lot, no problem. The other thing was, like, I mean, some of the things are funny. It, it, it's not all funny, but uh, for instance, um, wine could be made for uh, sacramental purposes, for, for religious purposes. So of course, religious devotion went through the roof. Um, doctors could prescribe wine for medical conditions that they, thought would be helped by wine. So people became unimaginably sick. Um, and when all they were all they were suffering from some was something no worse than an incurable thirst, you know? But it was also the case, the sad side of it was that it led to the rise of organized crime and it validated um, law breaking by normally law abiding citizens. You know, people who wanted to get a drink, you know, they weren't gonna run a red light or they weren't going to park where they shouldn't park or they were going to look after, they weren't going to rob from their neighbours, but they were going to break prohibition. And that entrenched a sort of a, a mindset that um, made law breaking um, acceptable. And that was it, the sad legacy of, of prohibition. It only lasted for 12 years, I think it was, 1933. It was, it was, it was eventually repealed, you know. I don't know how we got from Burgundy to prohibition but anyway that's wine that's the great joy of wine you've done a lot of research for your upcoming book yeah i i and i love that sort of thing you know i really do um even the glassware for instance so many different types of glasses out there now for wine and um, food and wine matching is a big thing big big thing of you know which wines go together i don't like to get too caught up in food some people they take it almost to a, a molecular level as i said um, like it's like they examine the DNA of a dish and examine the DNA of the wine and get a DNA match, you know, sort of thing. And I sort of say, oh, come on, come on, it's food, it's wine. It's not, you know, it's not space science sort of thing, you know. And then the final chapter is what next? Trying to look forward and see, you know, what's what's coming um, in the wine. Where I mean, climate change is, is the biggest topic at the moment in, in the world of wine. It's having, I mean, for instance, I mean, you'd be well aware, better aware than I am of the wildfires in California last year. And uh, if that happens on an ongoing basis, I mean, it might, it might threaten the viability of the wine business there, you know? Um, so there's those, those sort of problems coming in. I also think that we, there's a sort of a, a split between the most basic um, industrially produced wines and the, the high-end artisanal ones, you know? These ones at the, high, at the highest end are impossible to buy, they're so expensive. The other ones, they're, they're satisfying in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a very basic way, that, in the sense that they're faultless, 
but maybe that's their fault. There's nothing, you can't really push against them. You know, you take a sip and that's it. Whereas with a great wine, you should be able to take a sip and another sip and maybe get a different sort of flavor. You know, it, it keeps you interested and engaged right the way through. Whereas the first sip of the basic industrial wines, it gives you everything. You're not gonna get any more. So I, I hope that doesn't take over. I mean, wine, it, I always see it as a different type of a beverage. You know, there's, there's a story behind it. There's, there's people, there's place, and that gives it context. And that's, you know, why I love Burgundy so much, but many other regions as well. All around the world, there are great regions like that. And uh, that's what I celebrate and cherish. But um, who knows? It's very hard to know what, what's coming down the line. But certainly climate change is, is it's becoming an issue. And it's not just people think, for instance, um, say in Burgundy, for instance, the harvest in Burgundy is much, much earlier than it used to be. So, you know, warmer summers, ripening the grapes quicker. That's the most obvious thing. But it's leading to all sorts of other things. And, you know, you know, these once in a century catastrophic events that are now happening once a decade or even more so. Um, it's happening, for instance, things like today, this year in Burgundy, the winter and early spring was mild. Now what happens then, it, it advances the vine's uh, growth. So the little buds come out earlier than they really should. And then that exposes them fatally to spring frost because a spring frost in say mid April, where the temperature just goes down mid to maybe to minus two or something, it can kill off the crop. So there's all sorts of um, problems coming as a result, and uh, it's making it, it really challenging. You know, winter frost is no problem to a vine. When the vine is dormant, you know, the temperature can go down to minus 20. Before, my, that's minus 20 um, centigrade. I'm not sure what that is Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is, that's probably about thir zero. 32 is freezing in Fahrenheit. So I'd say zero Fahrenheit perhaps. So it's really, really cold. Um, that doesn't bother the vine in winter, but the little nip of spring frost um, in, in April, if the buds are out, that can cause terrible, terrible damage. And then there's hail in the summer. You've got hail storms, which is like firing a shotgun into the vines, you know? So lots of trouble there. And these things, which as I said, were very unusual, very rare events are becoming much more usual. Um, probably too early to say if it's a direct link with climate change, but climate change is, is the prime suspect at the moment, you might say. Did you want to mention any more about your wine talk or online presence presenting Armchair Traveler wine tastings? I'm busy developing that. And I wanted, you know, now that things are opening up again a little bit, um, I want to, to look towards developing that. Going, I'm thinking of going, I, I, I'm beginning to see myself as a wine communicator as much as as a wine writer. In the past, everything I did was writing. Uh, now that was already beginning to change before COVID struck. It has just accelerated it, you know? Um, I will always want to do the in-person tastings and so forth. I always want to continue writing my books and also writing for magazines such as The World of Fine Wine, which is a wonderful quarterly magazine, probably the best wine magazine in the world, World of Fine Wine, really, really great place to be, you know? Um, but I do see myself moving more into the online. I'm really interested in the, the new TV channel that the 67 Pal Mal have, have brought up. Um, I want to, my website is basically dead. I'll be honest with you, hands up. Uh, I want to revive that, perhaps look into podcasts and um, that sort of thing. Talking to a few people who've got expertise in these areas, you know. Um, so I see it like a year ago, I wasn't nearly as optimistic as I am now. Um, I'm, I'm really quite excited about the future and the possibilities. And one of the challenges, you touched on this earlier with a number of different things. One of the challenges is I can't do it all. So I want to try and pick the right couple of avenues to go down, you know? And um, I do think that whole online thing is, is the way to go. And I mean, I can do it for anyone. I mean, you know, if there's someone on the other side of the world who wants a tasting done, well, I can get up at midnight and do or whatever time suits them. Um, and there's already a little bit, of, I've done some tastings which, where you've had attendees in different countries and it works fine, you know? 
So um, yeah, really, really interested in that. And um, yeah, want to, want to move forward there. I, I, I'm sure I'll, I, you know, there's, there's parts of book writing where you say, I hate this, I'll never, ever do this again, you know. But of course, then you do. You know? <laughs> of course, with the seminars you're giving online, that would be more unique in the sense that it's timely. You could, if something happened today, you could talk about it. Whereas with the book, it might take a year or, or more before that ever gets into print. That's right. It, it, that's a very good point. I was doing a tasting there a few months ago. And prior to it, it was about a burgundy tasting. Prior to it, not in connection with it, I emailed a winemaker I know in Burgundy asking him about um, the, the frost problem they had just had. And halfway through the presentation that I was doing, I got his reply and I was able to read it out to people. I'd been talking about, I'd been talking about the frost problem. And I said, well, look, this has just arrived in the last few seconds. Yeah. So it could not be more up to date. And he is saying, with problems here, not so bad here, and so forth. So yes, you can respond instantly, yeah. and um, you know you do it almost. It's almost like reporting live from a yeah. from from a. I don't want to say a war zone, but you know that sort of thing. Do you have any advice for new writers? Oh, no, I saw that question coming through. Well, <laughs> the first thing I'll say is this. Now, this is not, this advice is not unique to me or unique to writing, but it's worth bearing in mind. If you're thinking of taking up writing as a career, if you can think of somebody you know, a family member, a trusted friend, relation, confidant, someone whose who's intelligence and whose who's, who's opinions you respect and who has your best interests at heart, talk to them. If they can talk you out of being a writer, then don't do it. Yeah. And they should try hard. If you're going to be a writer, it has to be as essential as breathing. Because if it's not, you won't stick it and you won't, you yeah. just won't have that. There's a doggedness and, and just a, a cussed determination. I mean, I my sort of routine when I'm writing, when I'm book writing. Writing an article is a different thing. You've got a deadline, you've got a copy deadline, you've got a word count and so forth, thousand words by this date. That's a different thing. An awful lot of the book writing is just self-motivation. You know, you, so I would, I, as I say, I ambush myself in the morning, get up out of the bed, pull on my clothes, splash some water in my face. I don't shave, I don't brush my teeth and I just go straight to the desk and I sort of, <clears throat> And that's my way of doing it. And if I get that sort of two hour stretch done, then I get up and have a shower and clean up and have my breakfast and so forth. If I get that done, then the day progresses from there. I get some more done, then I go back over it, maybe edit it a bit, that sort of thing. And um, I would say that to anyone, you must have some sort of routine. You must have some sort of gun to your head and um, whatever way you do it. Even if you only write for half an hour a day, do it. And the longer you leave the gap between it, the worse it gets. So write every day, that's another one. Mm -hmm. But forget the romantic notions of the, of, you know, the, the, the scholar up in his attic, you know, and the rest of it. It's a dogged pursuit. And it's, you know, you know the old phrase, it goes something like in any creative world, it says, um, you know, composition or writing is, um, you know, 99, sorry, 97% perspiration and three percent inspiration well the modern take on that is that it's three percent inspiration and 97 percent not being distracted by the internet that's yeah. that. you can spend your life researching on the internet oh i just followed this link and the day is gone it's just gone so turn it that's the other thing i do the night before i turn off my uh wi-fi and uh, it means the next morning, you know, like you, you're completely disconnected. And uh, that's the way I stay for as long as I can. Of course, that's then you say, oh, I haven't heard that before. That's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have to. You absolutely have to. And um, I'm also a great believer. I, I also say that um, if you write first thing in the morning, the night's sleep, the word I use is 
it has dislocated you from the world. You know, you've 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 cut the tie, the worry about this or that, or I must do that, or I've got to ring so and so. You've dislocated, you've disengaged from the world. So remain disengaged. Keep your Wi-Fi turned off and get that two-hour stretch done. Um, and somebody even said to me when I when I explained that system, they said, so you like you just make yourself a cup of coffee. I said, no, no. <clears throat> Because if I make a cup of coffee, I might see that I'm low on coffee and I need to buy some coffee. The minute that happens, you're gone. You've re-engaged with the world. You must remain dislocated, disengaged for a period at least. And you've, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing how useful that is. So for instance, um, particularly during the winter, it's dark in the mornings and I don't turn on any lights. So I just have the screen and um, my laptop screen and like you're you're completely zoned in there's no doubt about it, it really does it but this is all stage management you know you're just playing tricks on yourself yeah. you're, you're boxing yourself into a corner until there's no other you know you've nothing else you can do there's no other the only escape route is by typing a few words i would always look forward obviously i'm looking forward to the next the next book wine talk and um, I'd encourage people to watch out for that. Um, I may get to the States to, to, I did a launch in the States in New York for breakfast in Burgundy. So if I can, I might come back for, for, for a wine talk and um, I'd be sure to let you know about that.